Hey, today we are continuing with uh, part three of the series that we've been in over the last few weeks called People Problems. People Problems. Talking about the truth about how to deal with the difficult to love people in our life. Over this series, we've acknowledged that we all have at least one, if not half a dozen, if not to 12 dozen, all right, difficult to love people in our lives. They're there. So how do we know how to serve them, love them, just as God would call us to? In week one, if you missed it, we talked about how to deal and how to love the critical people in our lives. We said we all got that person who just got that spiritual gift of fault finding. They can do it with the best of them. How do we love them? Then last week, we talked about how to love hypocritical people, the people who say one thing, but then live a different way. What does that look like? So today, we're going to talk about how do we love the people that can be overly needy in our lives? How do we love those people who can be extra needy, those people who always need just a little bit more than we are able to give? Okay, there's a there's a principle that in any group, any team, any family, there's always one that's just a little bit crazy. All right. Just a little bit needy. Anybody willing to acknowledge you got somebody like that? Okay, I believe there's a verse in scripture says wherever two or three are gathered, one of them's just a little bit crazy. All right. It says something like that. Now, uh, man, how many of you willing to acknowledge that you've got somebody in your life right now? It already came to mind. They're just a little bit needy. They drain you over the top. Just raise your hand if you got got somebody in your family at your workplace, raise your hand, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up, keep it up if that's you. Okay, now look at all the people, look at all the people who don't have their hand up and you say, there's always one. There's always somebody who's just a little bit needy, right? Hey, if you have a, a copy of scripture, you can open up with me today to Acts chapter 3. That's where we're going to start today is in Acts chapter 3. We'll also hit some other passages throughout our time together. If you don't have a digital or hard copy of scripture, we'll put the verses on the screen behind me. As we talk about how to deal with those people who are always in need, how do we love and care for those people who are always hurting, they need a little bit extra of attention, and what we give never seems to be completely enough. You know when you see them that the conversation's always going to take a little bit longer, right? You know, when you start talking, there's a good chance they're about to take over. They're going to dominate. And you're going to hear that same story that you heard last time that you heard the time before that, right? Sometimes these people can err on the side of being negative just a little bit. They can always play the victim card. Even when you give your very best from the bottom of your heart, it never seems to be enough. They are the people that you give and they seem to want even more. It may be that relative, maybe that's in your family that you really do love, but maybe they live alone and they really need kind of an extra amount of support from you. Or it could be somebody that's maybe in your life group. Here's a part of the exchange and they just don't have a whole lot of friends and they think that you are the only friend, right? Or it could be your buddy that's in always in need of more money and then a little bit more money and then just a, just a little bit more, just some this week, right? And then the next week, you know who I'm talking about? Or, you know, maybe it's that friend that's at the office, that coworker who's always fishing for compliments. Like, how'd you think I did on this? What do you think about this? Or do you see what I did here? Anybody, anybody work with that person? Just nod with me real quick. Or how about this? It may be your friend who is always on the struggle bus, all right? It is drama this and drama that. You know who they are. Don't point at them, okay? Just look ahead. Like, I don't even know what he's talking about. I don't have anybody on my road, nobody in my family that's like that. You see, it's complicated because here's the reason. As followers of Jesus, we really do care about these people. Um, and we want to help them however we can, but it never seems to be enough. Then if we start to pull back, if we start to regroup, then we feel guilty because it's like we leave them stranded or we leave them in need. We want to help them, but if we help them in the wrong way, it ultimately hurts them and it can hurt us. So how do we help them with God's love, with God's intentions? How do we do it in a way that actually lifts them up without hurting them or us? So that's what I want to talk about today. I'm going to give you three truths. We're going to put some scripture around that, put some uh, stories and examples from scripture as we learn how to love the difficult to love people who can be just a little bit needy in our lives. So here's the first truth I want us to see is that we should give strategically. We give strategically. Listen to me. Here's what we're saying. We want to help them strategically because most of the time, we as people, we don't give strategically, but most of the time we give emotionally. We see a need, and because we care, which is a great thing, we just react. We do the first thing that seems easy or convenient or something that actually kind of makes us feel good or relieves a little bit of our guilt. 
And often we engage emotionally when someone's in need and we do what feels good. But what do we want to do? We want to give strategically. So instead of focusing on what they want or what gives us relief, listen to me, we want to ask, what do they really need? What do they really need? What will genuinely help, not just in the moment, but what will help for the long term? For this to happen, we have to be prayerful and we have to be strategic. In Acts chapter 3, um, Peter and John give us a great example of walking this out. <clears throat> One day they were walking by the temple gate. There was a man who was sitting there begging, asking for money, and these guys gave a response. Now, this man was unable to walk. So every day, perhaps maybe some friends or family members would take him to the temple gate. He would sit there. He would beg for money because that was what he wanted. And so people would see him, and ultimately they would respond emotionally and give him what he wanted. Now, Peter and John took a different approach. So pick up with me, Acts chapter 3. We'll start reading in verse 3. Here's what it says. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, catch this, expecting to get something from them. Let's stop there. What did this man do that those who are in need really know to do? He knew if you ask long enough, if you are consistent and persistent enough, then someone will emotionally respond finally and give you what you want. Even though it may not be what you need, somebody will ultimately see that and they'll finally just give you what you want. This guy had learned that every single day, if he just relied on others, then they would carry him to the gate where he wanted to be and he could sit and ask for the thing that he wanted and eventually somebody would come along and give it to him. They would give the guy what he wanted, but catch this, it was never really what he needed. Now, what do we do? Well, we often do what's easy, what helps us feel better. Think about it. What did this guy want? The answer is easy. He wanted money. What was the easy thing to do in that moment? Give him some money, right? Reach in your pocket, grab some loose change, kind of toss it to him. Be like, here you go, buddy. Let's solve this right here. Look at what I did. Look how holy I am. I've given him what he wanted. But what Peter and John didn't do is they didn't respond emotionally. But instead, led by the Spirit, under the power of God, they didn't give the guy what he wanted but ultimately they gave him what he needed. And here's what happens next in the story. Pick up verse 6, Acts 3. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. What did he do? Instead of giving him a hand out, if you will, Essentially, he gave him a miraculous hand up. And rather than giving him what he wanted, he gave him what he needed. Now hear me, it's so much easier many times to give a hand out. But it may take more time, it may take more sacrifice, may take more commitment, more prayer, more faith to ultimately give a hand up. It's not just to give a hand out, but to give a hand up. Rather than giving somebody what they want, we actually give them what they need. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I could give you what you're asking for, or I could give you what God is telling me to give you, which may be more than you could ever ask or imagine. That's why we want to be led by the Spirit. We pray, God, show me what it is that you want me to do, and then we're going to give strategically as God leads us. Now, the moment that you start trying to give someone who is needy what they need rather than what they want, what becomes their response so often? Well, if you really loved me, you would give me blank. If you really love me, you'd give me your time. If you really love me, you'd give me that thing I've been asking for. If you really love me, you would give me money because that's what I want. Now listen to me. What we need to have is we need to have the wisdom and the real love to say, because I love you and I do love you, I'm not just giving you what you want, but I'm giving you what the Spirit is leading me to give you, which is ultimately what you need. Okay? We're giving strategically. Let's make this real. 
what's a person going to say? Well, I really need $300 to make my car payment, right? It's coming up at the end of the month. If I don't pay it, they're coming to get it. I need $300 to make my car payment. But what you know is they just bought an Apple Watch, a pair of Yeezys, and they've been playing Fortnite all night. Am I talking to anybody in the room? Uh Uh-oh, that might have got too personal. Listen to me. So what we may say is, I know what you want, but I'm going to help you rather than giving you $300 to make your car payment in time. I'm going to help you get off the couch and get a job because that's what you need. Hear me? You may want me to validate you, but what you need to learn is who you are in Christ. That is what you need. I'm not going to continue to meet a need that I was never designated to meet. I'm going to help you find out who you are in Christ. Or maybe it sounds like this. You want more time with me, but you need to develop your own identity. You need to see that you are valuable to God and that I'm not the only one who can meet your needs. He gives you a big, broad family to belong to where you can find identity. Listen to me. This may be what you want, but God's leading me to give you what you need. I'm not just going to do what you want. So God, give me wisdom to do what's right. God, give me wisdom to do what's right. I'm not just going to tell you what you want to hear, but God, give me the courage to tell them what they need to hear. Okay? I heard a story of a couple who was trying to help a family that had fallen on hard times. The dad had lost his job. There were multiple kids in the family. Christmas was coming up. They didn't know what they were going to do. And so this couple who God had blessed and given the means to take care of them, they were like, man, we're going to do something above and beyond that's super generous, ultimately compassionate. And so they went out and they bought all these great Christmas presents for the kids. They wrapped them up. They got them prepared. They took them over to the family's house, knocked on the door. And the family's like, oh, man, you guys are great. And they walked in. They gave the kids the presents. And the kids are opening them all up, and, and then the couple's desire, man, they were just hoping to bring some, some life, some joy to the moment. And as the kids are opening up the presents, they're all fired up, but then the couple looks up, and the dad is gone, and he's sitting on the corner of the couch with his head down, looking ashamed. And in that moment, ultimately, they had desired to honor he and his family, but what had happened is, unintentionally, they had dishonored him. Because instead of helping the dad win in front of his kids, they had sent a message that what your daddy can't do, some other people have now come along and we've done for him. Great intentions, a great heart, a lot of kindness it was done with, but it wasn't truly helping what would have been better in that moment. Well, it may have been that the couple would have said, hey, listen, how much do you have saved up for Christmas? And he said, well, I got a hundred bucks. And they said, well, listen, we want to match that or we want to double that, but we're going to give you the money so that you can go help take care of your kids. Or if they said, hey, what what kind of skills do you have? Maybe he had the ability to do things around the house and fix things. And they said, listen, we want to bring you over for a day or two and we're going to give you a generous day's wages to bless you so that you can bless your family. See, what the guy needed was dignity, but what they gave him was toys. As we encounter needy people, we must be very prayerful to say, God, lead me. God, give me wisdom. God, give me clarity. It's so easy when we see somebody in need to do what makes us feel good, to give the quick fix for the situation. But what may take more wisdom, more discernment, more time is to give them what they ultimately need. Because we're followers of Jesus, we don't just go and relieve the immediate need, but we want to give a hand up and not just a hand out. So you have needy people in your life. How how do you love them? I think you you start with giving strategically. God, give me wisdom to not give emotionally, but to give wisely. Okay, next is this. We serve wisely. We serve wisely. Look at the way all throughout Scripture that Jesus cared for people. What did he do? He served selflessly. He loved authentically. He gave generously. He taught faithfully. He listened compassionately. Then, listen, he would go off. He would step off, go aside, and reconnect with the Father to recharge. And then he would faithfully jump in and serve again. Over and over, you see this rhythm in Jesus' life. I give out, I give out, I give out, I unplug and I recharge so that I can give again. You can't give when your cup is empty. And God calls all of us to be give life people who would pour out. But listen to me, in order for you to keep giving, at some point you have to stop so you can fill back up. Jesus modeled this. Look at Mark chapter 1, verse 35. You'll see it on the screen. It says that very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, 
went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He got alone with the Father. And then verse 36 says this, Simon and his companions went to look for him. So Jesus steps off, man. He's going to be alone with the Father to unplug, to refill. And Simon and his buddies start looking for him. Verse 37, pick it up. It says, and when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. Simon's like, Jesus, where are you? Jesus, Jesus. everybody's looking for you, Jesus, right? Listen, this is real life. This is exactly what it's like for moms who escape to the bathroom just to try to get a moment of peace, all right? Am I talking to any mamas in the room today? All right, you got that little ones at your house, right? You just need a moment, like like 30 seconds, you'll take it. And so you go to the bathroom, you close the door, right? You lock the door, all right? And then the next thing you hear, mama, mama, where are you? We're looking for you, right? And then you don't breathe. You make sure that door is locked. You turn off the light. No sudden movements. You lock your phone because you had Facebook open and you're afraid that light might show underneath the door. I'm talking to somebody in the room. I know that I am. And then the inevitable happens. The fingers underneath the door. <laughs> Mama, we're looking for you, everybody. Listen, you just wanted a moment to unplug. You just needed 42 seconds to regroup, Right. Think about it. It's the same thing that happens when you're on the airplane. You ever flown before? What do they always do? They tell you in the pre-flight thing, hey, if the plane loses altitude, the oxygen mask drop out of the ceiling, then what do you do? You take the oxygen mask first, and then you put it on yourself, and then you look around and you pick which kid you want to put the oxygen. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Listen, then you put the oxygen mask on your kid. Why? Why? Because if you're not healthy, you can't help your kid be healthy. Listen to me, this, the principle is the same spiritually. We're called to give, to go, to make disciples, to pour out, to love others, to serve others. But if you are not filling back up, you can never be healthy enough to pour out. Think about the, the story that Jesus told known as the Good Samaritan. There's a guy who gets beat up. He's left half dead. A Samaritan comes along and he man, bandages the guy's wounds, picks him up, puts him on his donkey, takes him to the inn. And it was hard to believe for anybody who even heard the story because a Samaritan never loved a Jew. But this guy did in Jesus' story. And here's what happens. Luke 10, 33. Pick it up. It says, but a Samaritan, as he traveled, he came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him. He bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey, brought him to an inn, took care of him. Verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. He's pouring out, man. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. The Samaritan gives the innkeeper some money, and then he says, hey, take care of this guy, and I'm going to pay you back when I come back. I'm going to cover all of the expenses. Now, where did he go? Where did did he leave to? Now, we don't know exactly because Jesus doesn't really tell us in the story, but we could kind of assume he went to one or two places. He either went back to see his mama and them, or his wife and kids, because that was the right thing to do. Or he went back to work. Why would you go back to work? Because when you go to work, you get paid. And when you get paid, you can help pay somebody else's hotel bill when they're in trouble. You see, what did he do? He went back and in some form or fashion, he did what he had to do to keep himself healthy in his rhythm, to keep himself supplied so that he could be ready to meet the needs of others. Every now and then, you have to unplug. I heard a wise person say one time, you can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. Some of you need to write that down and put that somewhere. You can't say yes often if you don't say no occasionally. Listen to me. This means that you are intentional about creating time for you and the Father. For you to be reminded about who you are apart from your role as a mom. Apart from your role as a grandparent, apart from your role as a boss, that you find identity in him. It means that you fight for for a day of Sabbath in your schedule. You go, I can't get a day. You fight for half a day. I ain't getting no half a day. You fight for two hours. God has commanded Sabbath since the very beginning of time. Why? Because he knew that we could not pour out if we didn't replug into him. And for some of us, that's such a hard concept to wrap our minds around. How do you help someone who's in need? You want to be able to pour out of a full cup because once your cup is empty, you've got nothing to give. So how do we love those who are needy? We give strategically, 
We serve wisely. And the third truth this morning is this. We trust completely. We trust completely. God, we're going to do what, you know, what we know you are leading us to do. Then we're going to trust you with the results because you are faithful. We'll do what you prompt us to do, God, but we're trusting you with the results. Here's the problem, church. It is insulting and dangerous for me to ever think that I am someone else's answer. It is insulting and it's dangerous for you to think that you are the source to meet everybody else's need. It's dishonoring to God to say that we're necessary in every case. And if it's not happening through us, it may not happen. Listen to me. We are not someone else's answer. Jesus is their answer. Jesus is their answer. We are the delivery system, but he's the power. We may be a willing conduit, but he is the power. The problem is, if you think God needs you to fix everyone else, your God is too small. If you think you're necessary in every way, you might be very well short-circuiting the process that God has set up, that he is working, because you keep rescuing someone from where he set up natural consequences to teach something in their life, that what you reap will be what you sow. How often do you think that maybe, like maybe we interfere with what God is already doing? Because let me say it again. If you think that God needs you in every situation to solve everybody's circumstance, your perspective of God is way too small. Paul says it this way. He was teaching about actions and spiritual consequences in Galatians. And here's what he said to the church at Galatia. Galatians 6, uh, verse 7, chapter 6, verse 7. He says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. But whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. We do what's right, we help prayerfully, and then we trust the results to God in the lives of the people that we love. This is a principle all throughout Scripture that there are consequences to behavior. In Luke chapter 15, there's a familiar parable that probably most of us know called the prodigal son, right? Where the dad has two sons and the younger son comes to his dad and he says, Dad, essentially, I wish that you were dead. But since, the, you, since you haven't died yet, I want what's coming to me and I want it now. I want the inheritance now. Go ahead and give it to me so that I can do what I want with it. And what happens? The father ultimately honors the son's request and he he brings to him the inheritance. And what does the son do? He squanders it all. He blows it. He wastes it. And in this story, we begin to see the father's response. That the father, he, he prayed every day. He watched every day. He hoped every day. But you know what the father never did? The father never rescued the son. The father never rescued the son. He loved him enough to allow the son to end up in the pig pen, eating the thing that pigs eat. And finally the son one day goes, hmm, this isn't working. What would it look like if I went back to my dad? That if I went back to him and I apologized and I owned where I'd been wrong because he's got servants and they're doing better than what I'm doing right now. Listen to me. He came to his senses. And the father loved the son enough to let the God-given consequences play out in his life. So the son would come to a place where he would come to his senses. Hear me, we must understand that rescuing isn't always helping. Rescuing isn't always helping, mamas. Daddy, rescuing isn't always what she needs. Sister, I know you're helping her out, but rescuing is not always helping, okay? Maybe for that employee, listen, if she's always late to work every day, but you have to be the alarm clock, all right, it may be that she needs to show up late one day and get reprimanded by the boss if she's going to realize that there's responsibility that she must take. If somebody's partying their brains out all day long and all weekend long and they're in jeopardy of losing their job or their scholarship, may mean that they need to lose their job or their scholarship so that they can realize there's consequences for how they're living. If they keep swiping the card and swiping the card and swiping the card, running the debt up and going on vacation, buying the purse and buying the outfit and buying the car they don't need, but then they can't make the rent payment at the end of the month, 
You know how you realize how to make the rent payment at the end of the month? You stop buying all that stuff you think you need, but you don't really need. Listen to me. You hear, you hear that and you go, that sounds cruel. Like, man, that's, that's cold-hearted. That's cruel. Listen to me. That's not cruel. That's actually a very loving thing to do. Because rescuing is not always helping. Sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom before people wake up to realize the consequences of their bad decisions. I've heard story after story after story, literally of hundreds of people over the last six and a half years who got us connected here to our spiritual family called The Exchange. And there are people who just like that, they hit rock bottom. And it was in that place that God awakened them to realize not only just their earthly need that they had, but ultimately their spiritual and eternal need that they had for a Savior. And it was in that place that they begin to acknowledge, I am broken and I am needy. And I need a Savior in my life. And they call, they had nowhere else to look but up to the one who was above all. The only one who could fix the real brokenness, the core issue of their life. Now hear me, when we help, and I believe that we are called to help, we always do so as the body of Christ. We always do so from a posture of humility. And sometimes it's so easy for that arrogance to rise up in us. And we step into a situation and we give the money or we give the help in hand. And we're like, man, look at me. Let me post that thing on Facebook real quick, all right? Listen to me. No, we, we help from a posture of humility, not arrogance. I heard a guy say one time, he's like, well, this person, he's talking about somebody, he says, this, this is my project person. Everybody's got a, a project person that they're kind of working on. Listen to me. No, hear me. People who are in need are not projects that we help, but they are people that we love. They're people that we love in the name of Jesus. They're not projects that we help because ultimately, ultimately, one day, I think all of us will come to that place of realizing that we are in need too. Truth is, we're all needy. The church, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, is just this big old family of needy, broken people. I think a personal relationship with Jesus is really good, but a shared one, oh, is so much better. So you can pray for somebody from a distance, and that's obedient and powerful, but for you to lock arms with them and to walk through that together with them, to go, we mutually are in need of a Savior. We're broken people sharing in this pursuit of a God who's loved us and rescued us together. Oh, in that is a beauty because you ultimately both walk in to go, we are people in need. Listen to what David wrote and confessed about himself. Psalm 70 verse 5 says this. Look at it on the screen. It says, but as for me... I am poor and I am needy. Come quickly to me, God. You are my help and my deliverer. Lord, do not delay. Oh, David, he was a king. David was a giant slayer. He was a revered man. But what did he realize? He realized he was needy. He needed other people in his life to walk alongside him, to encourage him. But ultimately, he said it there. He needed, above all, he needed God to raise him up, to deliver him. And church, because we are all born in sin, Romans tells us, we are all born needy. We are helpless and hopeless. We are trapped with no way out. But in our most needy moment, God in his love stepped in to give us not what we wanted, but what we needed. And here's how Psalm says it. Psalm 40, verse 1. Look at this imagery. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry. And look at this phrase. And he lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock, and he gave me a firm place to stand. Church, the truth and the good news of the gospel is that we are all needy. But God is the greatest example of love, gave us not a hand out, but he gave us a hand up. And he reached, without thinking, he reached into the brokenness, the chaos of our sin and our shame and our guilt. And he gave us not what we wanted, but what we needed. And he gave us grace and salvation and mercy and love. And if you're in Christ today, that's your story. You're a needy person who's been given not what you wanted, not what you deserved, not what you earned, but ultimately what you needed. And hear me, that, 
That is how we make Jesus known to the world, is in the way that we love. The broken world will never look at us and believe us because we have awesome theology. You need to know what you believe, but the world's never going to go, oh, they got great theology, I want that. The broken world is never going to look at us and go, oh, man, those Christians, they got great worship. They got cool music. Let me come get some of that. The broken world is not going to look at us and go, hey, they got big buildings or they wear fancy clothes. Give me some of that. No, the broken world will look on and they will long for what we have when we respond with love.